Uh, welcome all. Uh, so this is the third talk in the series uh, for adversarially robust uh, streaming algorithms. We are very happy to have uh, Omri Ben Elizier with us today. So Omri is a postdoc at uh, in the math department at MIT. He received his PhD in computer science from Tel Aviv uh, very recently last year. And he has held postdoc positions at Wiesman and Harvard uh, as well. So uh, Omri's research uh, focuses on algorithmic designs in complex environments with special interests uh, in sublinear algorithms and streaming algorithms. We'll be uh, listening to one of the one of his like really amazing works on streaming algorithms today. He also works on large networks, robustness and privacy and knowledge representation. So Omri has also won a couple of best paper awards, uh, one in Sigmoid. Uh, so in 2021, Sigmoid Research Highlights Award and also the first uh, Blavatnik Prize for Outstanding Israeli Doctoral Students in Computer Science. So yeah, we are very happy to have Omri today. He will be uh, talking, telling us about robust sampling and online learning. Thank you so much, Venkata, for this. Uh, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much for this uh, uh, introduction and for this uh, opportunity to speak uh, in this uh, uh, talk series. It's, it's very exciting also to have a talk series on universal streaming. Um, I will talk uh, today about uh, robust sampling and online learning. So I will talk about random sampling in this adversarially robust uh, context. And this is based on a couple of joint works with uh, Noga Alon, Yuval Dagan, Shai Moran, Moni Naor, and Elon Yogev. Please feel free to ask questions during the talk. Um, feel free to interrupt. Um, so this talk, as I mentioned, uh, will be on random sampling. So sampling is a basic primitive in statistics, ML algorithms, in, in general in science, in, in many areas that we care about. And um, in this talk, uh, we will discuss the performance of random sampling in adaptive environments, in environments that interact with the sampler in some way. So we're kind of, we have a feedback loop as 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 uh, we we saw in the previous uh, talks um in the in this uh, robust streaming uh, line of uh, talks um so we will we will discuss con uh, context where uh, future elements that uh, arrive that 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 are uh, arrive and we can sample actually depend on what we sampled in the past um the focus will be on uniform sampling where we sample each element with the same probability. There's also very interesting uh, follow-up work on uh, non-uniform sampling methods, particularly in important sampling, which is a very important, uh, a very useful technique in, in, in a variety of uh, data analysis uh, algorithms. Okay, so let's maybe uh, start uh, with defining our context, defining uh, our model and, and what we what we care about. And it will be easier to start with the offline or oblivious setting where we don't have adaptivity, we don't have an adversary that uh, sees our samples and interacts with them. And we will generally be interested in laws of large numbers. So a law of large number in statistics basically tells us that if we take a large enough sample from some population, then the sample converges to the same structure as the data. And typically what we care about is the sample complexity. How many samples do we need so that the sample will indeed be a good representation of the data? Okay, but now we need to, to, to say what we mean by being a good representation of the data. So the, the, the formal setting will be as follows. Um, so we want to compute multiple statistics about the data. So let's assume that we uh, receive an input, an unknown data set, uh, x1 up to xn. Uh, the elements are uh, from some universe that we know. Uh, we know the length of the, of the, we know the, the size of the data. We also know what the universe is. And there is also a known set of statistics um, that we uh, care about in the data. 
So for example, suppose that uh, data is a collection of, of uh, uh, records about uh, personal records about, uh, of, of, of people. So for example, one of the statistics we might care about is whether each person is um, taller than, uh, than height X. So um, we, we will care about statistics that are binary, that uh, produce e either zero or one. And by saying that, uh, and when saying that, we, we will say that the sample is representative of the data if for each of the statistics that we care about, um, the, uh, the mean of the statistic in the sample is close to the mean of the statistic in the data. So if, for example, uh, this is the fraction where I'm looking at F1, the, the first statistic. So if, for example, this is the fraction of uh, people that are at least as tall as X, um, we will want the fraction, and this is in the whole data, in the whole population. So we will want uh, the fraction of people that are at least as tall as X in our sample to be at most plus or minus uh, epsilon uh, from this uh, fraction in the data. So the sampling error is the supermoon uh, over all statistics of this absolute difference between the sample mean and the data mean. And uh, we, we say that we have uniform convergence in general if the sampling error is at most epsilon. So the difference between the, the green and uh, the red uh, bars is almost is, is always at most epsilon. And I would like to remark that uh, it's some so th these kind of notions have many names in, in in different areas that they arise over and over again. So, for example, uh, uniform convergence uh, means that uh, large enough samples uh, are an epsilon approximation of the data with respect to uh, the set system. In this case, it's, in, it's a set system because it's uh, the functions are binary. So, with respect to the set system F. So epsilon approximation is, for example, a notion that is uh, very common in computational geometry. Um, a uni so, and now a uniform law of large numbers basically tells us that for a set of statistics f and for proximity parameter epsilon and error probability delta, um, there exists a sample size. So if you take more than this number of samples, then the, the, the whole sample will be an epsilon approximation of the data with good probability, with probability one minus delta, with respect to um, to f, to the set of the statistics, and in, in other areas, stati statistics may be called the ranges. So this is usually in geometry or hypothesis. This is in theory of ML. Okay, so this is the setting, and um, just wanted to make sure. So if if anyone ha has any questions about the setting, I think it's important to to ask them early. So feel free to do so. Um, but let me maybe uh, exemplify uh, the setting with uh, with a simple uh, motivating, exam motivating example, which is median estimation. So let's suppose that we have a data set of n elements, that are real numbers, and we want to understand what is the sample size that we need so that the median of the sample will be a good approximation of the median of the stream. Now, what do I mean by good approximation? So if I order the if I order the elements of this of the of the data uh, from uh, uh, smallest to uh, to largest, if if I order the elements uh, this way, and I now take some sample of some size uh, from the data, I want the median of the sample to have a rank between one half minus epsilon and one half plus epsilon. And for this case. Um, we can define the statistics to be the one-dimensional thresholds. And uh, by one-dimensional threshold, I mean uh, functions that um, are uh, equal to one up to some point, up to some value a, and then they are zero um, for the rest of the way. And it turns out that if the sample represents, um, if the sample is, is an epsilon approximation of the data with respect to the set of one-dimensional thresholds, then the median will indeed be the median of the sample will indeed be a good an epsilon approximation of the median of the data. But I think the most central and most natural motivation for this setting is agnostic pack learning. Um, so in uh, statistical learning, we typically have a family H of hypothesis, 
and we want to capture, we want to return uh, the hypothesis age that is that best explains the data, that is most kind of correlated with the data. Uh, in this picture, it, it uh, correlates with uh, the hypothesis where the green line is, the green bar is, is the highest. Um, so, so this is what is called agnostic pack learning in realizable pack learning or simply pack learning. It's usually, it's usually the case that we have one hypothesis that has a probability one to be correct. Uh, it's a slightly different context. It's, it's also relevant. It's, it's also related to the results that we are going to discuss, but still um, for simplicity, let's focus just on agnostic pack learning, which is uh, the more interesting setting uh, uh, for our context. Um, and so we want uh, to return um, to return an hypothesis that is within epsilon uh, of the of the highest uh, empirical of the highest probability of the highest frequency within the data, and we allow a, a randomized answer. So it's probably approximately correct. Uh, this is a probably the, this is a probably a part of a, of a, the equation. So we only need the answer to be correct with probability one minus delta. So it turns out that uniform convergence immediately implies agnostic learning because if we learn uh, the, 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 the means of all of the statistics uh, over the delta up to uh, over the data up to uh, an error of uh, epsilon or over uh, up to a sampling error of epsilon, then we can immediately solve agnostic learning because, because then we will be able to capture the, um, the statistics for which uh, the mean is highest up to an epsilon. And the fundamental theorem of statistical learning basically tells us that uh, the sample complexity of uniform convergence and of agnostic pack learning is the same and uh, up, to, up to a constant factor. Both of them are controlled by uh, the VC dimension of um, the family of statistics F. And the VC dimension, I, I guess that many of you have, uh, uh, I guess that most of you heard about it, and I guess uh, many of you also saw the definition, but I would like to repeat the definition because it's, it, it is very relevant uh, for the rest of our talk. So uh, the VC dimension, named after Vapnik and uh, Chervonenkis, uh, of a family of statistics F, or you can think of it as a family of subsets of uh, some universe um, new, but but let's think of it as statistics for now, is the largest cardinality, D, of a set S that uh, uh, we say is shattered. Okay, but now what, what is a shattered set? It's a, sh it's a set so that any subset that you take of this set, so for any subset that you take, there is a statistic F so that the subset of elements in S for which the statistic evaluates to one is exactly this subset T. Or if you think about it visual, uh, visually, then it corresponds to, so you can think of it, for example, in, in uh, using a tree where in each node of the tree, we have an element and if if this element is is uh, if if this function evaluates to one on this element and we go to the right, if it evaluates to zero, we go to the left, and then each leaf corresponds to uh, so each each leaf corresponds to a specific f from the family, and 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 specifically in this uh, in this kind of tree uh, visualization of of uh, of the VC dimension. All elements in the same depths are the same. So the, uh, in depth zero, the only element that appears is x. In uh, depth one, it's it's y. In uh, depth two, it's uh, the element uh, z, and so on. Um, so it's kind of an, an, a non-standard way to to visualize uh, uh, the definition of the VC dimension, but it will be very natural for our purposes. Okay, so just maybe to summarize qualitatively what we what we saw so far, um, the following are equivalent for a family F of statistics: uniform convergence, which means that all statistics of the sample are close to the are, uh, the means over the sample are close to the means over the uh, data. F has a finite uh, as finite uh, VC dimension, 
f is pack learnable uh, in the realizable setting, and f is agnostically pack learnable. Okay, so uh, this is uh, basically the background that we need from the offline setting, and but uh, today I want to talk about uh, the adversarial setting. Um, and uh, let me uh, present now the adversarial model uh, for our setting. So the assumption so far was that we are given kind of a, a, a batch of data. Um, it's, it's kind of give, given to us in advance. We don't interact with it in any way other than sampling from this uh, batch of data. Um, so in some sense, the data generation process is fully independent of the sampling process. But as was discussed in the last uh, two lectures in, in the series, it's just not realistic in many scenarios. I mean, if, for example, a user uh, interacts with a database, um, so, um, so uh, the user sends some query to the database and then the database responds to this query. And then the user sends a query that depends on, on, on what the database uh, provides uh, to the user and so on. So kind of this is an interactive environment, uh, and new, query, new queries, new information that the user provides to the database depends adaptively on uh, what we did in the, what, uh, on all of the interaction that happened in the past. And it's also true from the other side. It's also true from the database side. And there are numerous other examples that uh, we could talk about uh, where it's just not natural to assume, to, to make this assumption that the data, data generation process is independent of the sampling. Um, and now we, we want to ask the question of what happens if future data that uh, uh, is generated um, in, in some streaming setting depends on the previous states of the sampler. So uh, the following model, which was uh, uh, devised uh, with uh, Elon Yogev, um, has two players. One player is the adversary on the right side. The other player is, is uh, the sampler. And in each round, what happens is that the adversary picks some element and sends it to the, to the sampler. So uh, an element of its choice from uh, the universe. And then the sampler uh, tells the adversary whether this element was sampled or not sampled. So the adversary knows what happened, what was sampled in the past. And now it sends another element that could depend on, on the previous interactions. And the sampler immediately tells the adversary again whether this element was sampled or not, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is actually a very powerful model from the adversarial side. So the adversary is very powerful and the sampler is very weak uh, at, uh, uh, in this setting. So uh, first, the adversary has an unbounded computational power. Uh, it knows the entire history. Um, it, it can choose whatever element it wants from uh, the universe. It kind of has a, a white box or open book access to uh, the memory of the sampler. It knows everything that happens within the memory of the sampler, except that it doesn't know uh, uh, ran the randomness. So, so the sampler kind of in each round generates fresh randomness in order to decide whether the next element will be sampled or not. And let's assume that the sampler uses the most standard sampling techniques. So for example, Bernoulli means that we sample each element with probability P independently. Uniform means that we uh, choose in advance the number of samples that we want to take and adapt our probabilities along the way. Reservoir is, is, is a nice uh, sampling technique that doesn't uh, require us to know the length of the stream in advance. So any of these standard and, and basic sampling techniques work for the discussion. They, they don't, the, the differences are very, are very small. Okay, now let's consider the case study of uh, estimating the median uh, or estimating uh, one-dimensional thresholds. Um, so in the static or oblivious case where we don't interact with, uh, with, uh, with the data, so the data is given to us in advance, um, it is known it, and it is not hard to show that the, the number of samples that we need to take so that 
the median of the sample will be an epsilon approximation of the median of this of the stream or the median of the data i'm talking i'm saying a stream because because uh, uh soon we we will be talking about streams um but um the the, the number of samples that we need to take the sample complexity it depends only on the success probability only on delta and on the error parameter on the sampling error epsilon it does not depend on the length of the stream for, uh, of the of the of the size of the data for example um and the proof also in the static setting is very simple um you can basically you need to to apply churn of bound twice um you just need to ensure that not too many elements are far below the median of, of those who, which were sampled are far below the median and not very, and not a lot of elements are 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 too far above the the median And well, this is a very simple proof. It 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 works in the obvious case, in the static case, but it doesn't work in the other, in the adversarial case. Um, so it's not just that this specific uh, proof doesn't work, but it turns out, and I will I will now uh, present to you an attack that actually shows that it's not possible that the sample complexity will be a constant for this for this specific. Uh, um, example in the adversarial setting. So let's consider the following attack by the adversary. So the adversary maintains an interval in which from which it sends elements. Initially, let's take the, uh, the interval to be uh, the, all the real numbers between 0 and 1. So let's say that the adversary uh, picks the middle element of the interval of the interval it maintains at any given time and sends it to the sampler. Okay, so let's say that uh, this uh, first element was sampled. Now, if the uh, element that we sent was sampled, then let's say that we go to the left, by which I mean that instead of the current interval, I, I take uh, the adversary will continue in the left half interval. And let's say that if the element was not sampled, then we continue to the right half interval. Okay, so now we continue to uh, the interval uh, between zero and one half. Uh, and we send again the middle of this interval, which is one quarter. Let's say that this element was not sampled. And that's, okay, now we go to the right. And this is what happens when we do not sample, when the sampler did not sample. Again, we send the middle of this interval. Let's say that this element was not sampled and so on. And, and what we see here is pretty interesting. So all of the sampled elements are bigger than all of the non-sampled elements. So the sample is kind of, if you think of, of uh, being representative in, in this setting as, the, as, a, as the, the situation where the median of the sample is has a rank that is more or less around uh, one half with respect to the stream, then, well, the sample is very unrepresent unrepresentative in the setting. It's we we kind of expect the the uh, the elements uh, of the sample to be inter interspersed between the elements of the stream, but it's clearly not the case here. Um. So. So th this bad news show that and and you can well, since uh, uh, the. Um, we assume that we can choose any element between zero and one. Since, uh, um, so this strategy that, that can go on uh, indefinitely, and um, we certainly, certainly, a, a constant size sample will not be able to to deal with with this kind of strategy. But if we think of uh, uh, the universe in which we work as a finite universe U, then. Uh, um, the the news are not as bad maybe so um basically this construction only works the construction that we just described it only worked um more or less if the sample size is is is, is bounded by some a uh, log term of uh, the universe size so if you think of the universe as let's say i don't know uh, all of the computer words with uh, 64 bits then well, log of that it's like sixty four log of in base two it's it's sixty four it's it's not it's not that big of a uh, 
of a sample size that is required to um, to overcome these kind of attacks. Um, and the good news is that, are that uh, 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 this is not just a, this is not 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 just a property of this specific attack, but actually a sample of pretty small size suffices always in the adversarial model for this problem. So, um, so we, you might recall that in the static setting, uh, a sample of size, which is uh, the VC dimension plus log one over delta divided by epsilon squared, was enough for the sample to be uh, representative to, um, to satisfy uniform convergence with respect to the data. Um, so here we just replace the VC dimension, which is O of one in this case, with some log term of the size of the universe. And this is actually uh, uh, true more generally. So for any family F of statistics, a sample of size that is uh, so the same bound, except that you replace log of the universe size with log of the size of the family of statistics, actually suffices for a uniform convergence for a uniform law of uh, large numbers in the adversarial model. And again, you can see the uh, uh, static case for comparison. And I would just like to, to comment that uh, you can replace this log f with the VC dimension times the log of the universe size. So um, so the, the difference from the static case is that this is um, it's, it's just this log of the universe size factor. OK, so maybe this sounds like the end of the story. We just have logarithmic terms remaining. But well, it's not very satisfying first because the universe could be could still be huge in, in many settings um, and also because this bound is kind of not as satisfying as having as, as knowing something that depends only on the vc dimension so i think we we, we we might be looking for something that is more satisfying maybe for a combinatorial parameter like the vc dimension that uh, uh, captures this adversarial setting but first, before jumping this, to, to, to the search uh, for this combinatorial parameter, I would like to, to say just a few words about the proof. Um, we will uh, say a bit more about the proof uh, later on, but the main idea is um, uh, for this uh, specific bound that, that we've seen is to take a union bound over, uh, over all of the statistics. So for each statistic, we apply this analysis um, separately. And we want to show that for, for each such a fixed uh, statistic, the sample mean of the statistic is close to the stream mean of the statistic. And well, when you think about what the adversary can do, so let's say that the, the sample mean is, is, is equal to, to some value and the stream mean is equal to some other value. And the adversary can either try to send an element to send an element X for which f evaluates to one to the sampler. This will increase the frequency of this element in the stream, but also with some probability it will also increase the uh, frequency um, of, uh, of elements uh, that, are, that evaluate to one in the sample. It can also do the other thing uh, of uh, uh, sending an element with uh, f x equal to zero. This will decrease the frequency in the stream, but also maybe in the sampler. And it turns out that you can model it by uh, by martingales. So um, th these are very, uh, I guess, many of the many people in the audience uh, uh, have heard and maybe have worked with martingales. Uh, uh, these are probabilistic. Uh, um, so uh, these are random variables. These are basically sequences of random variables where, um, for for every i, kind of the the next the the expectation of the next random variable in the sequence. Um, depending on, on everything we know so far, is equal to the value of the previous random variable. So this could be mo modeled by Martingales. And in the original analysis with Elon, uh, we use Friedman inequality, which is um, an, 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 a, a Martingale concentration inequality that is suitable for cases where, or kind of unbalanced cases. 
but I think what I want to highlight here is the conceptual message that even though the adversary is super strong, it's unbounded computer, computer, computationally, um, it knows, it kind of has white box access to the sample. Um, and, and even though the sample, the sampler is, uh, is very naive, it's kind of uniform over a newly sampler, still the randomness is enough for us to, to prove useful upper bounds. And it basically allows us to, to create this, uh, this whole story as a probabilistic process. So random, so kind of injecting rand randomness along the way uh, um, when you have an adversary is a very useful strategy. And we see it over and over in the robust streaming literature. So again, uh, our next goal would be to, so we have this, um, this bound on the, the, the sample complexity required to uh, get uniform convergence in the adversarial setting, but we are not we are not fully satisfied with it because log of the size of the family of statistics is not as clean of a, is a, not as clean of a combinatorial characterization as the static case where we know it depends on the VC dimension. So we want to understand uh, to, to get a tighter balance for this. Um, for the sample complexity. Any questions so far? I think it's a good time to ask. Okay, so let's continue. So, um, so now I want to, uh, uh, to, to continue the search for this combinatorial parameter that will characterize adversarial sampling and Let's revisit our adversarial attack as kind of a tree. So um, in, in our tree, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a decision tree for the adversary. So at each point, uh, the adversary sees the current element. It asks whether this element e uh, evaluates to one or not. If this element evaluates to one, um, okay, sorry, it, 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 it checks basically whether the element is sampled or not. If it is sampled, it, go, it is go to the right. And, and if it is not sampled, it goes to the uh, left. So, for, so, so in this particular example, um, the element one half was sampled. So we went to the right, the element one quarter was not sampled, we went to the left and so on. And uh, um, in the end, we, we got to, to, to a leaf, to, to, to a set, to some, uh, uh, to some sets of, some set of elements that were sampled and not sampled that kind of were consistent with, um, so there is some a, a threshold function, but there is some one dimensional threshold that is consistent with this picture that um, until some point it is, that is kind of, Sorry, it's, it's, that is kind of a, a fully not consistent with this picture. That kind of, uh, until some point it it is uh, always evaluates to one, and after some point it always evaluates to um, to zero. So, for example, take the threshold uh, 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 point four. Is a, this is one example. Um, so we can think of it of the adversarial attack as a decision tree, and. As we mentioned, you can also visualize the visit dimension using a tree. But there's one important distinction. And the distinction is that in the visit dimension uh, uh, tree, all elements in the same depths were always the same element. It was always y in depth one, always z in depth two, and so on. Um, and in this attack tree, uh, the elements can, can be different in each uh, node of the tree. and What I would like to, um, uh, to to talk about now is little stone trees. So little stone trees look exactly like the attack tree. So um, again, you can represent them uh, uh, using trees in the same way that uh, uh, we consider the VC dimension. But here, uh, each time that we ask a question about a certain element, about whether it is uh, evaluates to one or not, this element, so uh, we, we, do, we do not have the condition that all elements in the same depths have to be the same element. So it, it could be dependent on the path that we took so far. So basically, this is just a generalization of 
um, of, uh, of the attack tree that we uh, just considered. And now the little stone dimension of, of a family F of statistics is just the largest depths of a complete tree um, that uh, can be shattered uh, in this way. So basically each pass in this tree ends up in a function that agrees with, with the whole pass that um, evaluates to one uh, uh, in the points uh, uh, of or, or in the point, points in the past that evaluated to one and evaluates to zero otherwise. And it doesn't care about elements that it, 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 it uh, did not meet um, during the pass. Okay, so as we said, the attack looks just like a little, uh, just like a little zone tree. And um, we know many nice things about the uh, little stone uh, dimension, about little stone trees. So uh, the notion of uh, little stone dimension was proposed by little stone in the late eighties, but only about twenty years later it started to gain to to it was rediscovered and started to to gain uh, more traction. And nowadays, it, uh, the, so in the last few years, there were very impressive results that uh, related the little stone dimension to various interesting problems. Um, in any case, uh, when I when I talk about online learning, I, I um, mean the following setting. So we have again we have an adversary, uh, but on the other hand, we have a learner. The learner doesn't sample anything. It's uh, it tries to to um, to learn a, a, a best hypothesis, uh, uh, as in the agnostic uh, pack learning setting, except that uh, we now have an online adversarial setting. So. In this online learning uh, game, in each round, the adversary picks an element X and it picks a label, yes or no, but it only sends the element to the learner. And then the, the learner makes a prediction uh, for this element. And finally, in the end of the round, the adversary announced what was the actual label to the learner. Now the learner's goal, uh, as usual in, in online settings in ML, is to minimize regret. Here, the regret is the number of mistaken, of kind of incorrect labels um, as compared to the best hypothesis F in, uh, in, in, in the whole uh, family. And as usual, so uh, uh, we, we think that we say that something is online learnable if the, the amortized regret is little of one or, the, or if the stream is of length n then uh, we said that it is online learnable if the total regret is, a, is little of n. So this is the setting for online learning. It doesn't involve any sort of sampling. So maybe uh, um, at the first glance, it, it is not clear why it, why it is related to, to our sampling setting. But on a second glance, it might, or a second look might uh, uh, reveal some connections uh, between um, online learning and our adversarial sampling setting. So our adversarial sampling set setting is kind of, we kind of look for an adversarial uh, uh, uniform law of large numbers, which is kind of an online version of the uh, uniform, of of uniform law of large numbers that we had in the static setting. We do know that uniform convergence implies pack learning in the static setting. So it might be tempting to, to, uh, uh, to believe that this, this is also true in the adversarial setting with respect to online learning. And since uh, online learning is characterized by, uh, so um, the regret is characterized by little stone dimension, maybe it is also true for our um, online sampling setting. And indeed, both of these predictions turn out correct. So um, all of the following are equivalent for family F of statistics. So satisfying an adversarial uh, uniform law of large numbers, having a finite little stone dimension, uh, being online learnable, and also other interesting properties. So for example, being pack learnable in the offline setting, but under differential privacy constraints is also characterized by uh, having finite little stone dimension. So it is very important and uh, uh, very uh, and it is a very important concept that that comes up in in interesting contexts. Uh, little stone dimension. Um, and now, so the lower bound uh, that we saw for uh, medians or one dimensional thresholds holds for any little stone class. It's basically the same proof. 
you need at least the little stone dimension uh, sized sample in order to, to get anything in terms of representation. Um, the good news are that you can just replace the VC dimension with the little stone dimension. And uh, this is tight. So th this, this fully captures, so now we have, for any family, we have uh, an upper bound and a lower bound it depends on the little stone dimension of uh, of this family so this uh, this means that little stone indeed fully characterizes uh, the sample complexity in this online adversarial setting um and it, it's achieved by, by 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 the standard samplers that i uh, mentioned uh, before it is also tight in all parameters um but uh, we don't know this for all uh, for all uh, families, we know this for specific families for which the VC dimension is equal to the little stone dimension. So there are various uh, geometric uh, uh, problems of interest where we know that this is where we know that this is uh, optimal. Um, there is there is an asterisk that that we require the sampling method. So uh, we don't know this about the sampling methods that are adaptive themselves. But for sampling methods that kind of uh, are oblivious themselves, that uh, the probability to sample any given element is kind of independent of the content. So for example, Bernoulli uniform and reservoir sampling are all obli oblivious. So this is uh, true for all of these uh, sampling methods. Um, and there's also the open question of uh, uh, whether, uh, um, of, so again, th th this is tight only in some cases, so uh, and we don't have yet tight bounds uh, for all the uh, families F. Um, and another application of the techniques is in online learning. So indeed, uh, the results for adversarial sampling uh, also have an analog for online learning. And it turns out that the optimal regret bound for online learning in this classification, in this binary setting, um, is a uh, is a square root of the little stone dimension divided by n. This is the amortized version of, of the regret. The total regret is a, a unity multiplied by n. And this settles open questions by uh, Ben David Pal and Shalev Schwartz and uh, Rachlin uh, Sridharan and Tewari, uh, where uh, the lower bound was known and uh, the upper bound was known up to uh, a logarithmic factor, uh, up to a square root log factor. Um, so so we close this uh, we close this gap. Okay, so just just to visualize uh, uh, what uh, how um, adversarial sampling and online learning are, are are related, so both of them, both the the error in the adversarial set, uh, setting in the adversarial sampling setting and the regret in online learning, are bounded in some sense as a function of a, a quantity called the sequential Radmacher complexity, and. So, so this is one of the com contributions of uh, of uh, this uh, second work, and um, another thing that we work is tighter bound of uh, on the sequential Radmacher complexity, and because of these tighter bounds, we also uh, achieve the, the tighter bounds on the regret in online learning. Okay, now I want to to talk a little bit in the last part about proofs and techniques. So this is a table of uh, uh, results and a table of techniques and the results that they are able to, to obtain. So um, I, I will go over it uh, row by row, but basically the first two techniques are kind of easier to follow. They are not as uh, uh, technically involved. And uh, I, I, I hope that you will be able to, to get the ideas between behind these two first rows. Uh, the last two rows are I will say some a few words about it, but it will probably be hard to say something very meaningful about them. Um, so I just try to give a very very high level picture of what is going on. Um, okay, but 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 before doing that, I want to uh, show the uh, the first inequality uh, uh, that is needed for the, the upper bound, and this is showing that the sample complexity is bounded in some sense as a function of the sequential uh, Rademacher complexity. So uh, we will use a, a useful technique in, um, in statistical settings and also specifically in online statistical settings, which is uh, called double sampling. Um, so 
we want to bound the error, which is um, uh, the supermoon over all of the statistics of the sample min minus the stream min uh, uh, in absolute value. So in this case, we have a sample of size three, we have a stream of size 12. Um, and it's not completely convenient for us to work with it. I mean, we, we can work with this, uh, but uh, for example, if you want to analyze it, then we need the martingale inequalities that are unbalanced. It's 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 a bit. I mean, it's 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 doable, but it's uh, uh, but we but uh, but the, the easier ways to to approach this, uh, to approach the analysis in some sense. So uh, we are we are looking for uh, for this. So basically, what I'm trying to show now is kind of a, a simpler way to um, to approach the analysis. So instead of comparing the sample mean. Uh, the mean uh, uh, of the sam of, of f over the sample to to the mean of f over the stream, we com we compare the mean of f over the sample to the mean of f over another ghost sample that the adversary knows nothing about. So it's kind of used only for the purpose of the analysis. We pick just three elements and. I mean, it, it's used just for the analysis. It's, it's not used by the sampler in any way. So the adversary doesn't receive any information about what the ghost sample is. And the benefit of this is that uh, we kind of now have a balance setting. So uh, each element can either be sampled to the, okay, so the, the next picture is that we basically don't, uh, now that we um, compute the supermoon only over things that happen in, uh, um, the original sample and the ghost sample, we don't care anymore about elements that are outside um, the sample. So we kind of have a balance setting where we put with probability one half, we go to the original sample and with probability one half, we go to the ghost sample. Um, and this is, uh, um, so if if you think about this process where you, you have a, a equal to ability to, to go to, to each of the samples, and uh, you try to, and you, and you look at, the, at, the, at this uh, supermoon expression. So for any specific statistic f, what we have is, um, so in each round, the uh, the adversary can either send, can either choose to send an element that evaluates to one person or an element that evaluates to zero uh, in the next step. And, but then, um, so if the element, but so if, um, um, and okay, and, and, and this, can, this can be exactly characterized by, um, by, by, by sending, um, by basically adding a, a plus one. Um, um, so basically we don't care about elements that evaluate to zero and for elements uh, that, that evaluate to one, um, we, we either gain one point if, uh, uh, if it belongs to the um, to the uh, original sample and uh, lose one point if it uh, belongs to the uh, ghost sample. And this kind of expression is exactly equal to what we call the sequential Rademacher um, of the family F. In this case, it is with the parameter 2K. Okay, so this was basically the first part uh, um, of of proving the upper bound, we connected the sample complexity to uh, uh, the Rademacher complexity, which is known to to be closely related to online learning. Um, and now I want to say a few words about the other side of the inequality. And as mentioned, I would like to maybe I would I hope that the uh, uh, the first the, the the first couple of techniques uh, I hope that the uh, uh, to make them more clear, the, the last two uh, rows in this table, um, I would also try to go over them, but let's try to uh, start with uh, uh, the proof that uh, uh, goes through union bound. So let's fix a specific statistic in our um, family. And we want to ask what is the probability that the sample mean um, differs by a lot from the mean over the stream. And we can apply Azuma inequality, which is uh, Azuma-Hofding inequality, which is a, 
uh, one of the most basic inequalities for uh, mar for martingales, uh, which applies to martingales with bounded differences. So we can apply it uh, to the Ra to the Rademacher complexity. So it, it turns out that the Rademacher complexity itself is um, is 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 a martingale, and we just we, we want to to bound this this expression in the right hand side by we want to ensure that the probability will be at most the total uh, probability for error which is delta divided by the size of the family of statistics f because uh, we will we will want to take a union bound so we want the total uh, probability for error to be delta and then you just rearrange the terms and you get the bounds in the first row. So this is basically the whole proof. For the second row, it's uh, uh, we want to make use of a nice uh, combinatorial property of um, uh, families with the bounded little stone dimension. So the Sauer Schellach Perlis lemma, sometimes called just the Sauer lemma, tells us that a family of uh, VC dimension D over a universe with n elements, um, it's of size uh, which is bounded by um, the sum of binomial coefficients n choose i, where i runs from zero to d. So it's kind of order uh, n to the power of d. And by itself, this in in the offline setting, this allows us to replace log of f with the VC dimension times a log n term. So this is optimal up to this, this annoying log n term, uh, this log n factor, which is actually pretty pretty difficult to get rid of. Um, and in the in the dynamic setting, in the in the adversarial setting, um, we do have an, anal an analogous result. It's not easy to prove. Um, it's not it's not kind of a, 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 it's it's not a trivial analog and and uh, if we try to to apply a proof that is similar that if you try to kind of a, uh, apply the proof uh, of a, of a SSP lemma in this online setting then it wouldn't it wouldn't go through because in in part because the universe can be much larger in some sense um but instead of uh, working with kind of a, a, we, with kind of uh, the, the, the the offline object with a kind of uh, uh, fixed in advance sets, we actually work with dynamic sets, or in online learning, you um, they are usually called experts that kind of develop as the stream uh, proceeds. So a dynamic set over a sequence of lengths n is an algorithm that starts with an empty set, and after each element is revealed. We uh, this this uh, dynamic set can decide whether uh, to add it. Uh, we can we can we we we, we basically may choose whether to add this element to the dynamic to the dynamic set or not. So, for example, uh, some of the elements we do uh, decide to add, and some uh, uh, we don't add. And it turns out that there is um, there is also a. a, a an SSP, a Sauer Schellach Perlis lemma, type lemma for the adversarial setting, where we just replace the VC dimension with the little stone dimension. And um, it basically uh, um, it basically shows that the number of dynamic sets required to cover F, where by a cover I mean that for each statistic in our family, there is a function in the cover that agrees with the statistic completely over the stream. We don't care about about uh, anything that happens outside the stream. Um, and uh, so it turns out that uh, um, um, uh, you can bound the size of a cover by n to the power of the little stone dimension. Um, and this this takes us pretty close uh, to the desired bound. So. Again, we are just off by a log n factor, and uh, this this was proved by uh, uh, Ben David uh, Pal and uh, Shalev Schwartz. Um, I think I will, uh, due to lack of time, I think I will not go over the proof of this uh, of the adversarial uh, SSP, 
but to, to, to obtain such a nice bound, there has to be a nice uh, induction, a nice combinatorial property. Um, it, it kind of looks like uh, uh, the, uh, the equality that we have in, in Pascal triangle. And indeed, it's, it's something similar. So um, it, it can be shown that if you um, um, to each element in the little stone tree, you, you assign, you, you look at the dimension of only the subtree, and you look at two, the two children of this of this element. So one of these elements has a smaller little stone dimension. This kind of follows from the definition. Okay. Um, so these were the, the first two, te two techniques. So, so far we saw a proof uh, through union bound and also double sampling, um, which, um, which was pretty simple. It just relied on, on, on the basic martingale inequalities. We also saw uh, that uh, an online adversarial version of uh, the SSP lemma is very helpful. It, it, always, it, it, it almost gets, 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 uh, gets us to, uh, to the desired bound up to this annoying log n factor. And now getting, getting rid of this log n factor is, uh, is a, um, pretty uh, challenging uh, technically. In the offline setting, it uses a technique called uh, chaining. Uh, it goes through approximate covers, um, which instead of trying to um, instead of trying to exactly cover uh, statistics from our family, we try to approximately cover them. And this is enough for the static setting. Um, so basically, what what is done with approximate covers is we take an an, an increasingly fine uh, and kind of increasingly fine a, a chain of uh, of approximate covers each each cover is better uh, is better representative is, 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 is gives a better approximation than the previous one and um and and when doing the analysis it turns out that uh, the error is bound is bounded by some integral uh, that depends on sizes of approximate covers along the way, but because because uh, uh, it it can be shown that the sizes of approximate covers are much smaller than the sizes of kind of an absolute cover, uh, it uh, it helps us shave a, a log n factor. Um, but we don't know whether this kind of technique works in the online setting, and uh, what we uh, so. Um, I mean, this this would be the the when trying to prove a similar bound in the online setting. This would be the first attempt, but we don't know how to prove this uh, uh, a similar bound in the online setting. And um, what we do in our work is uh, what is called fractional approximate covers, which replaces covers which are kind of just fixed finite functions with distributions over functions, and. With some more analysis that I will not go into, it can be shown that uh, if if we define the sizes of a cover, uh, the size of covers appropriately, then uh, it can be shown that the cover sizes in the fraction setting are much smaller. They are independent of n, and we can get optimal sequential Rademacher bounds. Okay, so uh, this uh, uh, this ends uh, 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 the part of the talk that discusses our result. I, I would typically uh, end with a few open questions, but uh, there are the, the several nice, uh, very nice uh, works that kind of uh, answer some of the most interesting open questions that I would have liked to ask. So um, I would like to mention these these works. Uh, so first, um, our works, our, our work, and this talk discussed uniform sampling, discussed random sampling where each element has the same probability to be sampled. Um, it turns out that also non-uniform uh, sampling methods, like important sam sampling techniques, uh, are also robust in adversarial settings. There is uh, a, a huge range of applications in geometry, ML, uh, and beyond. Um, and like our case, one one nice property in uh, for the for the important sampling set setting is that. The same algorithms basically work. No need to change the algorithm. It, it might be that you need to change the parameters, but there's no need to change the algorithm. Um, and it's it's kind of a nice dichotomy between sampling and sketching, where 
Um, sketch, linear sketching is, is very prone to, to adversarial attacks. It's, it's typically easy to attack it. I think David talked about it in the, in the first talk. Whereas sampling, because it, it uses fresh randomness each time, is much more robust to um, adversarial attacks. So this is another example, another nice example uh, um, that shows this. Uh, and, but this is in contrast to the static setting, where in many cases, catching is, is a bit more efficient than sampling. Um, or I mean, kind of sketching based methods are, can be more efficient than sampling based methods. Um, another follow up work uh, discusses the setting of beyond classification. So here we just cared about functions that are uh, uh, binary, that are zero or one. Um, and uh, um, there is also subsequent work um, that uh, discusses extension to uh, real valued functions and uh, much more general frameworks for fractional covers. So the ideas that we use in our work are not unique to, to the binary setting in any, in any way. Uh, they can be defined generally uh, and, and be very useful for a wider setting. A third uh, follow-up work uh, discover the explores uh, uh, the white box setting or open book setting uh, uh, that we have in more depth and shows for example results that are impro improved algorithms compared to what we are able to achieve uh, using random sampling um, in this white box uh, setting and also interesting deterministic to white box reductions and interesting cryptographic separations um, the, there's also work on um, uh, on the effect of having white box or open books of or open book access uh, in uh, number guessing games, which are uh, relatively closely related to uh, to to steering problems that uh, we care about. Um, and I think one of the most interesting follow up works uh, is about is about a beyond worst case setting. So if you try to uh, think to to look again at the, the adversarial attack that we had uh, for the median problem, it it looks that um, the values uh, tend to con so the uh, all but all but the first few values tend to concentrate in, in a very short interval. So the interesting the, the interesting stuff happens in a very short interval, and. Uh, um, so, um, so if if you if you consider a smooth analysis, a smooth setting where you 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 don't have a very good bit precision, uh, it's a it's a very good question I think uh, to understand whether this kind of attacks can work, and uh, it turns out that the answer is no. So in a smooth in a smooth setting, the parameter controlling the sample complexity returns to VC dimension. It's not little stone dimension anymore. Um, Okay, I think I will stop here. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. It was a nice talk. Uh, thank the speaker. Uh, so yeah, uh, we can take questions now if you have any. Uh, what I can 